Hi, and welcome to Extra Serving, a Nation's Restaurant News Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Petri. Today, we're going to be continuing our talk about earnings season. After the barrage of earnings last week, this week seems calm in comparison, but we saw several interesting chains report and we're starting to get more color on the season as a whole. Traffic remains a big through line of earnings season, and this week we saw Kava buck all trends and post 7.8% increases in traffic while maintaining profitability. On the other hand, Sweetgreen is yet to become a profitable company several years after it debuted on the stock market. As some brands, name recognition is the number one priority. Dutch Bros, Dutch Bros is aiming to be a household name by quintupling its unit count over the next few years, and El Pollo Loco is trying to be a national brand again. We'll also be talking about Shake Shack, Cheesecake Factory, Noodles & Company, Lumen Brands, and RBI. As Alicia Kelso says, stay tuned. This week's interview is Blaze Pizza, Beto Guajardo. And now let's turn it over to my lovely, lovely co-hosts. I'm Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief of Nation's Restaurant News. I'm Leanne Zinsmeister, Managing Editor of Nation's Restaurant News. And I'm Alicia Kelso, Executive Editor of Nation's Restaurant News. I had to throw in a stay tuned, Alicia. Alicia, it just felt right. Yes, it does. It always (laughs) feels right. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Liam was saying yesterday that you sound like a newscaster, and I was like, you know what? I think she'd like that. Yeah, Just wait, that I'm last wait. clip, that last <laughs> clip on yeah. today's episode of First Bite, I was like, Alicia has like turned into a different person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when when you don't have to look at me, it's it's fine. <laughs> Well, we love looking at you. You're beautiful. Well, there's a reason I went into print journalism and not <laughs> broadcast journalism. So I get uncomfortable. Please. I don't know. Stay tuned. And here we are on our podcast that's going to go on YouTube. Great. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right. So how are you guys doing? What's new? I mean, I realized we were talking about college football before this started, but I don't think we should continue that conversation because it's very heated here on the NRN team when it comes yeah. to college football. Could get so awkward. We'll pass over that and let's talk about other things that you guys like. I, I, can I say, I'd like to say, start um, by saying I had the uh, lovely experience of visiting Louisville last week uh, where Alicia is based and uh, we were attending a conference there. So I had an excuse to go. Uh, the International Food Service Editorial Council had the annual meeting there in Louisville and that was my first time in Louisville. You are lovely. And Alicia was a very wonderful host with she and her wife, Mickey, and their friends, and we had a lovely dinner. And so i just like to say, good job, Louisville. Alicia, well done. Yeah. I have to name drop Mickey, so that makes it even better. Yeah, hey, I'll have to let her know. Yeah, um, no, I've lived here, I think, 11 years. I still don't claim it as mine. I'm st- I still very much claim to be a transplant. Um, I don't have a, a Southern accent yet. My wife is super twangy and Southerny, <laughs> um, but I, you know, it has a lot of redeeming qualities. Uh, chief among them, the bourbon industry, which very Sam good bourbon. did a great Part job took. helping our bourbon tourism uh, while he was here last week. For anybody who is interested, the only thing I. The only thing I did not do, which I wish I had done, was take some bottles home with me. Um, that was on my mind, but um, as I am flying solo on the drinking front in my household these days, I was like, that's just going to sit there for a, a long time. Yeah. So anyway, I should clarify that my wife is pregnant. I shouldn't like that. That sounded, that sounded so weird. Probably people are like, what happened at the Ocas household? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we got I'm we got number three coming. That. So yeah, everybody they were was all thinking what is up in the Oka's household. Yeah, now that uh, no, it's if that were seems. the case, if there was something else going on, I'd be drinking that bourbon faster, right? Mm-hmm. Like one could say that that bourbon would empty very quickly. But no, my liquor cabinet is not getting drunk fast enough these days for me to justify buying more bottles of bourbon. Yeah. So I had to do it at the restaurant with Alicia, and we did go to uh, a, an Edley restaurant uh chef edward lee um mm-hmm. was a fantastic experience at nami that was very enjoyable um so if you're going to louisville check that out or of course what's the one uh, what's his um flagship magnolia um, magnolia yep. yeah that was i did not get a chance to go there but you're just I name dropping all over the place man you're just drop drop well drop. for anybody who listens to this podcast for some value they wants to learn something we got to give them some <laughs> tidbits if you're going to louisville here's where to go Here's what to yep. experience. Chef Edley is kind of like the guy in Louisville. Um, I don't know how many restaurants he has. Alicia might know better than I, but we Nami was a very good one, a Korean steakhouse. Well, That's people good. don't come here for facts. They just come here to listen to our lovely voices, of course. Sure. Right. Whatever you <laughs> tell yourself, Holly. All right. Let's dive into earnings. Um, there was 
Last week was crazy. This week was a little bit more normal. Um, but we still had some really interesting brands report. Uh, so, Alicia, I'm going to turn it over to you first so you can kind of give a summary of what's going uh, on. I don't know. I, I feel very dizzy. This has been just a really um, a stunning week and a half of earnings. I, I don't recall them ever being lumped together thusly like they have. <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't recall them. So, I, you know, I'm still unpacking a lot of things, even from, you know, last week's, uh, you know, crazy schedule. The one thing that I um, like to listen in on is, you know, every single company has such an interesting pulse on, on the consumer because they're discretionary spending companies, right? And I think we've been talking on this po podcast and elsewhere about the state of the consumer for a year. And I, I still don't think anybody can quite put a, a pulse on it. And I think if you look at, you know, is the, the, the earnings that are happening still, we, we had a couple today, in fact, um, uh, in Q3, we are still seeing a, a significant amount of mixed data on the consumer. And, we, and we've talked about this. Of course, this industry is huge and it's not monolithic and we're going to see mixed data on the consumer. But at the end of the day, it is still a discretionary, a consumer discretionary industry. And so, you know, these companies have as firm a pulse as anyone on what is happening. And from my vantage point, you know, there are some companies, Darden is a great example, consumers continue to be resilient. Uh, resiliency has been a major theme in Q3, um, but there's a huge but there, more selective. And a couple of companies discussed how they're becoming more selective. And I think what's interesting is when you think about everywhere from QSR to casual to fine dining up to Darden, we're seeing this. We're seeing a lot of, you know, trade in and out activity in a way that we haven't in quite some time. You know, obviously, obviously things were anomalous in, uh, during COVID. Um, and, and one thing that has really stuck out to me is that we have become a, 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 an increasingly um, bifurcated economy. Uh, several companies noted that they're doing just fine with consumers 75000 and above. Um, conversely, you know, the lower you go on the salary, uh, uh, poll, um, you know, those consumers are trading into, um, food at home. And it, it I am sensing that many investors, if not most investors can cont continue to believe that this is going to continue to soften in Q4. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think the, the the one theme, and I know that you, you guys talked about this last week, and I think it cannot be overstated, is when we talk about that resiliency, we look at the sales, right? I, I told Holly on a first bite, I was surprised to see pricing still elevated the way it is because we've seen inflation cool and we've seen traffic drop. So you would think that pricing would come down a little bit to sort of reconcile that. We haven't really seen that as much as I thought we were going to see. Consequently, we're seeing traffic erosion in a big way at many brands, and that's a problem, and that, that's a problem that needs to be rectified in this industry because traffic is a bigger deal, metrically speaking, <laughs> um, than, than, than sales. We, you know, our industry has to be positioned well against food at home, and that's our biggest share of stomach competition, uh, if you will. Um, the other thing, if I can, you know, I, I, I want to, there's a couple of positives that I've no, I've seen from Q3 because I'm, you know, insufferably optimistic, <laughs> but some of these comps I think need to be with an asterisk because last summer, 2022 was a really strong, um, you know, quarterly performance across the board because it was really the first summer that the industry didn't have any COVID restrictions. And so there was a huge, you know, 
this floodgate opening up where we saw what that pent up demand really, really meant. And so we've seen some comp pressures this quarter and I don't want to read the tea leaves too hard on that. I think it was simply a challenging, you know, year over year lap. Um, hopefully. Um, another thing that I'm really super optimistic, we are seeing margin improvements because we're seeing more efficiencies. We're seeing staffing improvements. Um, several, most brands talked about staffing getting back to normal. Um, and, you know, in the S&P top 500, consumer discretionary spending was the strongest. Um, so I'm going to take some of this as a, as a win. I do worry about, you know, the predictions that the consumer is going to continue to soften, but we've been hearing this for a year. So who knows? So I, that's my high level takeaway thus far. I'm not sure if that's what you were looking for. As super verbose as usual. <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't have, I, I'll just drill in on a few of those things. Cause I think Alicia summed it up really well. I mean, the first thing I would say is, I don't envy any restaurant company th that has to consider the pricing issue because um, I, I think the reason they probably haven't come back on pricing is because that's a huge gamble because right now that's helping them with their sales. And if they made that risk, they made that gamble and said, okay, we'll decrease our prices, bring it down in hopes that people come back. There's always the chance that they don't. And then you look twice the fool for traffic being down and sales being down, right? So they're keeping their sales elevated because they know traffic is down and then the higher um, price points are going to at least make sales look kind of okay. And so that's what you see across the board, right? You see a lot of companies with traffic down as Alicia's talking about, uh, but you know, for, for a same store sales point anyway, there's kind of some good news to report, even though we can all look at that and say, eh, it's not that good of news. If your same store sales are 4%, but your traffic is down 5%. Um, and so, so yes, I, I'm glad I'm not making that decision because that's probably what you're seeing in, in these companies, not bringing prices back down to earth is that you could sweep the rug out from under you entirely. And I think the other thing to point out that Alicia mentioned was this fact, you know, this, this sort of efficiency um, standpoint. In some regard, I see this year, last year, maybe to some degree, 2024, as a period of like, you just got to hunker down, retool your concept for the future, take the hits, because they're going to be hits, um, and recognize that hopefully on the other side of this thing, the the efficiencies, the changes that you make, the brand evolution serves you well in whatever comes next. Because, you know, Shake Shack is one example, you know, pointing to how much, Leanne, you did a great job writing about this, so I'll let you describe it a little bit more. But like they, you know, kiosks being so key to what they're doing and, you know, labor re retention and recruitment still being top of mind for them. Kiosks have uh, kind of taken over in this great way and become this great efficiency that they can, you know, try to focus on profitability by saving on labor through kiosks. Um, Dutch Bros, another example of a company that is just growing out of their mind. And I mean, their entire operation is built around efficiency because there's no dining room. It's a drive through only operation. It's a very streamlined menu. Um, we would all do well to look at Dutch Bros and understand what the future is. Um, especially if you're uh, a very focused menu, it doesn't have to be coffee. Um, but you know, they're expanding like crazy, even though their numbers are, don't blow you away right now. You know, once upon a time, their numbers looked more impressive, but you know, they're in growth mode and a lot of the efficiencies they've focused on are helping them quintuple their footprint. Um, which is just crazy to say that out loud that any company could do that, but because of the efficiencies in their company, they can. Even Burger King, they're downsizing, they're you know stripping out some of their underperformers. Again, I think if you really gave this season a theme, it would be you know it would be um, perfecting the concept, retooling the concept, making it more efficient, um, the operation more efficient, so that you can. Um, really enjoy the fruits of that labor in the future. But in the meantime, you know, you're just going to have to take some lumps. Yeah, I definitely see if you can call it a trend. One of the trends this quarter is that companies are talking about the same things they were talking about last quarter. Noodles is talking about pricing strategy. Shake Shack is talking about labor. Kiosks are a big part of that over there. Kiosks at Shake Shack now drive more than 50% of in-store orders which is huge for the labor piece. They're also making other labor moves. They are rolling out dynamic scheduling uh, 
and they're they're talking about retooling their whole labor model. Um, I think we're going to see things from them in 2024 in that regard. They just opened their 500th unit globally, and they are talking about new uh, drive-through prototypes. Uh, I mean, I think can remember just a handful of years ago, Shake Shack did their first drive-through and we all went, what? Uh, and now it's like one of their strongest channels. Uh, and so not only do they have their, I forget what they call them, but you know, their drive-through units, but they're talking about retooling those and making them stronger. Uh, so I think across the board right now, companies are just accepting that, you know, traffic isn't great across the board, but we're doing something right. So we're just going to double down on what we're doing. We're going to figure out how to do it better. And then hopefully when the consumer is ready to come back, we will have an even better product and experience for them. It's a great, um, you know, talking about Shake Shack and then Sweet Green, I think is a good parallel. And then also bringing Chipotle into this conversation. Chipotle reported, right? Yes. And, and I'll let Alicia talk about that because I think Alicia knows more about that than I do. But I, but if I could really quickly just share like, you know, Chipotle, Shake Shack, Sweet Green. I want to put these three brands out there because, you know, the three darlings of the industry in the past 20 years, you know, 20 years ago it was Chipotle, then it was Shake Shack, then it was Sweet Green. Not necessarily in that order, uh, Shake Shack and Sweet Green, kind of at the same time. Anyway, um, you know, all three of them started as these high quality, fast casuals. We will never do drive through because, you know, to Leanne's point, how many years ago we were like Shake Shack drive through? Really? And now they're investing wholly in that. Sweet Green is the same thing, right? Like Sweet Green is doing their innovation kitchen, uh, in infin infinite, infinite kitchen. Thank you. Um, I'm stuck in Taco Bell world. That's another story. Um, but, you know, they're finding, oh, okay, this can be successful for us. And Sweet Green, um, Holly, as you wrote, they are still not profitable, but they're getting closer because they're discovering with these investments that they're making in their restaurant, in their operation, in things like drive through and in automation they can save some money and become more profitable. Um, and I just think, you know, Shake Shack and Chipotle and Sweet Green, you can all see them arrive to that same conclusion at different parts in their history where they said, oh, maybe if we made things more convenient, more technology driven and more automated, we could really become more profitable. And Shake Shack and Chipotle, yeah, that's the case. And Sweet Green's going to get there too. Well, and I think one of the other through lines of this whole earnings season is technology. Joanna Fantosi wrote an amazing piece about all the new tech that's rolling out, but we saw Wingstop say it's going to make its own proprietary technology platform. Like, that's crazy. Chipotle has its new automated make line, which it hasn't talked about on its earnings yet, but Sweetgreen is making more of their infinite kitchens. They are wholly investing in this. And um, when it comes to technology and loyalty, I think we're seeing a lot of new moves forward in that. Kava talked about updating its loyalty program. Sweetgreen's doubling down on its loyalty program. We're seeing a lot of places use technology to, again, become more efficient. The, the loyalty piece is really interesting because when you can't find the traction that you need on traffic, you've got to make a strong play for frequency. And the way to do that is through loyalty. And, you know, loyalty is really hard to come by these days. There are dozens of studies that those younger folks aren't loyal to brands, you know. And uh, how, how many restaurant brands do you want on your mobile phone real estate uh, pushing you notifications? Um, and so, you know, I think we'll continue to see these iterations and these um, uh, ramp ups uh, of loyalty because frequency uh, and exclusivity um, are two really important components in this environment and will continue to be so because consumers are just used to this now. They're used to that exclusivity um, uh, angle, especially. One thing I think we need to probably touch on in the part in this bigger Q3 conversation is the value equation and how wildly different it is from the last time. I just think it's weird even talking about a downturn because we're not seeing that. We've not seen we've not even seen a soft landing yet. We've just been talking about the potential for a, a recession and predicting what's going to happen. But we are seeing, you know, a, a, a historically challenged environment in terms of inflation, um, you know, and, and so value has become more important in a strange way, in a different way um, than versus 2008, 2009, for example. And what I mean by that is, you know, it, 
every single company mentioned how important value has become. You know, that's no secret, especially when they're still trying to reconcile the pricing versus traffic piece while protecting their margins, which is critical, uh, which I think, Sam, is why we're not seeing the pricing come down as quickly as we still have to put those margins, you know, to paper. Um, but if you look at casual dining in particular, where they're where experiencing some pressure among, you know, their younger or their lower income consumers, we're seeing things like, you know, Chili's Three for Me, Applebee's, uh, you know, Bone, Endless Wings and Dollaritas, Olive Garden, Never Ending Pasta. These have been tremendous successes for these companies. Um, and they're not deep discounting. They're not huge. They're not Hail Mary passes going just to, you know, get people in the door and, you know, profitable traffic be damned. And, and they're, they're, they're smart um, promotions that uh, focus on the profitable traffic that all these companies are striving toward. And in fact, Red Robin, which we all know is going through this massive, you know, uh, revamp uh, from, from the past two years, they've got a five point uh, North Star plan in place, you know, they, they took the hit, their revenues were down, um, you know, mid single digits, they took the hit. They're like, we were expecting this because we don't want a deep discount like we did last year. We're going for profitable traffic. So we're going to do these promotions that get that profitable traffic in the, in the door, like those companies I mentioned before. And it kind of goes to what you said before, Sam, where it's like, we got to kind of take a little bit of pain to, to position um, you know, where we're going to be in 2024. None of us on this call know where we're going to be. In fact, nobody on these calls know where we're going to be. Um, and predictions about a softening consumer have been resonating for over a year now. So this is, this is a, the value conversation is growing, but it's growing in a wildly different way than it, I think it ever has in the industry, which is really intriguing. Well, you look at the brands that saw traffic increases this year, Chipotle and Texas Roadhouse, two really important traffic increases, Starbucks saw a traffic increase, and Kava. I mean, what do they have in common that they're all occasions that, you know, you want to go and enjoy yourself? Starbucks is a daily occasion, but Chipotle's not, Kava's not, Texas Roadhouse is certainly not a daily occasion. So it's people are going out for these more special things. Like for a lot of people, Chipotle is a special thing to go and get. Like it's not Sam, you were talking about your hometown. That's one of the fanciest restaurants there. Like Chipotle is, is not an everyday occasion, but it's a special occasion for a lot of people. Texas Roadhouse is certainly a special occasion, but these standouts are really saying that the consumer is not trading down in all aspects. Some aspects yeah. are trading up. Yeah, and, and I think um, it's clear that customers still want an experience, right? And and however they define that experience. And I think this comes back to even the the value conversation, which is, a value that Chipotle provides is a as a better experience um, for a QSR. If you want a QSR Mexican experience, Chipotle's value is a better version of that, right? Um, <clears throat> Cava, you know, as Brett even pointed out in his uh, Brett Shulman, the CEO, pointed out, I think on the call that you can't get those ingredients really at the grocery store. You can, but you're probably not going to have them on hand. You turn to a Mediterranean restaurant concept for those ingredients um, because you trust them to prepare it for you. That's a value Cava provides. Um, and so, and then Texas Roadhouse, that's a date night or uh, out with a family. And, and these are things people want. And when you think about discretionary income and the choices consumers are making, they might be holding back on the frequency of their QSR visit in order to have that weekly full service visit, right? And so I think that a lot of restaurant concepts understand that, especially some of the full service and up, upscale for their category kind of concepts, understanding we can provide an experience unlike any other. And so that's probably why you see the traffic, um, you know, really strong at those those companies. To stay on Kava really quick, though, I think Kava is so fascinating, of course, because they're just killing it with traffic, almost 8% increase in traffic. Their numbers ever since they went public have just been astronomical. And I think one thing that's really interesting about them, and, and I, again, I think Brett mentioned this on the call, is the white space they have ahead of them. Because I, I, speaking for myself in Columbus, Ohio, no kava here yet. And Columbus is the 14th largest market in the country, historically been uh, one of the places restaurants like to get to early because it's just a it's great restaurant town. Kava's not here yet. They could pop 20 to 30 of those in this market 
in the blink of an eye and they would just be off and running. Now there is a local Mediterranean concept quite like Kava that I dearly love. And so I hope they don't just wipe them off the map. Hopefully there's room for everybody, but that restaurant's doing really well. It's called Agape shout out to Agape here in Columbus. Um, you know, they, I think they prove that there's demand for what the, those kinds of restaurants are doing that Kava's doing. And, and I guess just to, just to say that like a, a, a restaurant like Kava, where it's again pri- providing the value of an experience you can't really get many other places um, that a lot of markets don't really have access to ingredients and flavors that customers are not totally accustomed to, and just the amount of opportunity to come into the market and own that. I mean, Kava is a story we're going to be talking about for five to ten years to come in a way that we had with Chipotle, just because you're going to start see- you're going to see them hit a thousand locations, possibly two thousand locations, just because of the demand for what they're offering and the white space ahead of them. Well, and they have everything set up to expand. They can, they have these fulfillment centers. They're not really fulfillment centers, but they're, you know, there are places where they can create these ingredients. They create the sauces there and that can hold up to 750 restaurants right now. So they are ready to expand. They're ready to become a big brand, but they also said that part of this is their IPO halo. They don't know if this is going to continue to the next few quarters, um, but they say this is their second quarter. And it's part of an IPO halo, they called it. Alicia called it a honeymoon phase. Uh, so <laughs> a little more romantic than IPO there's, halo. There's a honeymoon phase here. But I don't I don't want to be dismissive of the opportunity in front of Kava because you're right. They have the digital infrastructure. They have the distribution infrastructure in place. And Sam hit it on the, on the nose. That Mediterranean cuisine is in high demand right now. Um, and it has been, but there's not been anything to fulfill that demand uh, with the potential, uh, public potential that 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 Kava has now, um, I want to go back if I can to something else that Sam said about the experience, because I wrote a story. We Sam and I went to Prosper uh, Forum in August in Florida, and we were privy to some exclusive research there from Alex Partners, and what their research yielded was that consumers their their mindset has changed so dramatically um for you know for permanent in a permanent way um from the pandemic and what that means is they're they're spending different they're not just going out willy-nilly and buying stuff experiences have taken a significant amount of precedent and that research opined that this is to the benefit of the restaurant industry and a couple of casual dining uh, concepts touched on this, including Dine Brands, um, which said that, you know, dining out is, in and of itself, it provides that value. It's not about price. It's not about deals, discounts. Dining out provides value because it's quality time. It's, you know, an experience that you don't get at home. And, and so the research opined that this is a permanent change. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, a, a, accurate or not we you know time will tell stay tuned um but but i find that to be really fascinating because we've talked at length about the pent-up demand we've seen the pent-up demand um that came out of the pandemic for the past two two years it's still it's sustained right dining out is still very much a critical um need for a lot of consumers and and I, it, th- this research is is um you know opining that that is a permanent change that we are going to value these experiences um for the foresee- for foreseeable future over things because of what we went through and of course that has benefits to the restaurant industry well do you guys feel like you've spit out everything you can or do you, anybody have anything else in their their lungs to say i think q4 is going to be interesting <laughs> Just like Q3 was, just like Q2 was, I, I think, you know, I think that it's been really just dizzying trying to keep up and trying to figure this out. We've been talking about when the shoe is going to drop. We're looking at record high credit card debt. We're looking at student loans, interest rates, mortgage rates, you know, record high car payment rates. The consumer is undoubtedly pressured, but the shoe is, I don't know where the shoe is, you know, relative <laughs> to the ledge. And I, I, I just, I don't know, where's the shoe? Your metaphor is falling apart, Alicia. <laughs> Usually does, um, but you know, someone come with me. I, you know, I and I find it. Are really, we jumping really off a cliff? I'm sorry. Where are we going? No, but we're not. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> going off a cliff. 
<laughs> well, this is why this is why I count myself very lucky to be covering this industry. And I'm sure you guys do too, because it is, there's never a dull moment. This restaurant industry is always doing something for better or worse, and it keeps us on our toes. And I think because we're weirdos, we're junkies for this stuff. We we really like it. But um, sorry to anybody out there who is in the thick of it and doesn't find it as amusing as we sometimes do. <laughs> Good luck with your pricing. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> if it makes you feel better listening to a podcast about media would depress us in a similar manner. <laughs> this is right. This is a good point. That's why we just, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, same. What if we did? <laughs> All right, guys. It's been wonderful, but I think it's time for us to wrap it up. <laughs> We are talking about shoes a little bit too much. Uh, so I think it's time for us to wrap it up. So I'm going to shoot it over to Joanna, who interviewed Beto Guajaro, the CEO of Blaze Pizza. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks Holly. Holly. So, yeah, I guess just tell me about how your first year as CEO has been going so far. Yeah, thanks for the question, Joanna. So... Um, I started actually um, in the role of Blaze Pizza president and CEO uh, the first week of January of this year. And, you know, suffice to say, of course, I did my homework and I went to uh, dozens of Blaze stores before I ever accepted the offer. And uh, in those early days, you know, what I what I learned is that Blaze Pizza as a brand really does have a very strong customer following. People love the brand. And one of the things that they love about Blaze Pizza is the fact that they get to make it their own, right? So everyone has what they think is their favorite pizza and they come in and it actually is pretty surprising how people tend to get the same thing over and over and over again, but it's something that's theirs, right? So when I joined, uh, one of the first things I wanted to understand was, you know, how do we compare quality-wise, uh, value-wise, craveability-wise, right, to others in, in, in the industry, whether it's pizza or other fast casual concepts. And while we definitely had our fans, one of the things that I and the rest of my leadership team realized was that we need more, right? We need more people who love this brand unequivocally and say, Blaze Pizza is my favorite pizza in my town. And so, uh, you know, with that, and then looking at where we were from a technology perspective, um, our loyalty program, being able to uh, provide excellent service in our stores and technology within the four walls of the store. I uh, definitely saw a lot of opportunity and really the past year has been all about establishing what that roadmap is gonna look like to adapt better product, better technology, to provide better service and more craveability to our customers. Great. Um, and so the, I know the company has been adding some uh, multiple new executive leaders uh, lately. Can you tell me a bit about how you think that the fresh faces in leadership is, are driving the company forward? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, I have a phrase that I was once told that um, I like to live by, and that is always be grateful uh, for the new energy that's brought into your life and the spark that it can create. Because with a spark can come a new fire. And so I love when we have the opportunity uh, to bring new uh, talent onto the team. Uh, for Blaze Pizza, that's been a couple of things so far. Um, one has been bringing on a former colleague of mine, Kevin Moran, to become the chief development officer. Uh, Kevin brings a ton of experience um, into this role, but probably most importantly for Blaze Pizza is his experience internationally. Uh, so Kevin has a wealth of knowledge on how to expand businesses beyond the domestic walls of the United States. And then in addition to that, we brought in a new chief operations officer in Johnny Tellez. Uh, Johnny um, and I have known each other for a number of years as well, but uh, one of the things that Johnny brings is really world-class knowledge and capabilities of virtual operation support. Uh, Johnny was instrumental um, in building uh, the Customer Experience Center of Excellence um, in his previous role. And as he gets his feet on the ground at Blaze Pizza, you know, we're already having discussions on what is it that we can do to better support um, our franchisees and their store operations. Great. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in the development because it sounds like you guys are really trying to uh, ex 
expand Blaze to um, to new markets, even uh, kind of in new markets internationally. And so, what would you say are some of the challenges of uh, of expansion in new markets and new cities? Yeah, great question. Um, first, you know, let's start uh, with challenges uh, in the domestic market in the U.S. Um, you know, it's one thing to be opportunistic when investors come to you. It's another thing to actually be strategic and think about, you know, where you want to expand. And it's difficult to gain economies of scale, both in supply chain um, as well as in marketing, if you only have one store in a city, right? You need to have a footprint um, that's going to allow you uh, to gain uh, consumer uh, knowledge of you. Um, and 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 when you start to go internationally where your brand may not be known, that's even more important. Um, on international markets, you know, we seek obviously to go to uh, places where customers already have shown a petulance for loving domestic brands or U.S. domestic brands, I should say. Uh, we're looking for places where we know that the economy and or, you know, government regulation makes it easier uh, to actually do business in those countries. Um, and let's not forget, you know, the challenges of operating internationally when you're dealing with foreign currency exchange and the fluctuation of those exchange markets. And so absolutely, we're looking for a path of least resistance and some of those markets would not be of any surprise to you, whether it's in Western Europe or in Asia, right? We're looking for those markets that we know um, have a strength of supporting Western brands and ideally already have a love for pizza. They just haven't experienced place yet. That's awesome. Um... And uh, so I'm hearing something about a brand revamp for Blaze. Could you describe to me what that strategy is going to be? Yeah, great question. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, earlier in the conversation, you know, we need more fanatics. We need more fans. We need more people to say Blaze Pizza is my favorite pizza in the world. And while talking to, you know, several thousand consumers uh, in the research that we conducted, you know, what we learned um, in the pizza business, if you can win with great crust, if you can win with great sauce, and if you can win with great cheese, you kind of have the trifecta already, right, of becoming someone's favorite pizza. And when we looked at what we had, while certainly many people love what we have, we believe there's an opportunity for us to actually win with even more flavor. So win with the product, win with the flavor. Two, win with craveable value. You know, we're never going to be the discount pizza house like you get from many of the national chains um, who focus in on the experience of delivery. At Blaze Pizza, we believe that we win first and foremost when you come in and have a great customer experience led by the three most important words at Blaze Pizza, speed, speed, speed. <laughs> um, and it's almost a magical moment where you're creating your own pizza down the line and it comes to you in 180 seconds after you've placed your order. But on top of that, as mentioned, you know, with great flavor, uh, we will win more fans. Leaning into craveable discounts, and you're already seeing it, you know, on a monthly basis where we have provided for our customers what we know to be their favorite toppings on pizzas at a special price, at a special value. We've been doing that since June of this past year and teaching our customers that, hey, go to Blaze every month because there's something new every month. Uh, that you probably already love, but it's at great value. And come in and experience a great customer experience in our stores with the speed that we provide, the lively atmosphere, and the way we treat our customers in the Blaze approach. Uh, yeah, it really. what it really sounds like to me is that maybe some menu changes might be on the way, uh, as, as well as uh, new, new and exciting uh, discounts. Um, and so what would you say are some menu changes or additions that you're excited about? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so we're exploring a number of different fronts and I can't give you all the details, but I'll give you the generalities. Um, as we look at our signature pizzas, right? We believe that there are ways to either add or replace some of our signature pies uh, that make it easier for customers to make those choices. Um, in addition, menu design and being able to lean more into a visual representation versus just words and what it is that we're offering. Um, in addition to that, uh, new ingredients, as mentioned, that have more flavor, whether it's in our proteins or in our vegetables. Um, and we're also looking at new salads as well as new entrees that are protein only. And that's all I can say about that. Well, we look forward to hearing a bit more about that. Um, and so something I'd love to talk about is um, we were kind of 
following closely the the meteoric rise of the fast casual pizza category, uh, which I know just kind of struggled a bit uh, during the during the peak of the pandemic years. Um, and so how do you think Blaze has kind of turned that around and is making a uh, fast casual pizza category kind of like thrive again? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's really about building habit with your customers, Joanna, right? And getting people um, uh, used to having a, a reason to come to Blaze. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. When we were looking at, you know, the frequency of which our customers actually came to Blaze, it definitely decreased during the pandemic because fewer people were eating out and we didn't necessarily have that delivery network that many of the other pizza companies had. Coming out of the pandemic, we needed to create reasons to come to Blaze more frequently, more often. And we started doing that with product, as I mentioned already. But we also did it, you know, here in August, you know, we ran a kids eat free uh, discount opportunity on Tuesday nights because Tuesday was typically one of the least exposed family days, uh, you know, at Blaze Pizza. And by golly, within a month's time, um, Tuesdays became one of our busiest days. Uh, you know, during the month of August, and it'll be something that we'll be re uh, uh, bringing back uh, to the marketplace here in 2024. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, we've introduced some new technologies into um, some of our test stores that help us manage and measure, I should say measure and manage um, the service levels that we have in our stores and the speed of service. And what we're finding in those stores where we are more effective at measuring the effectiveness of uh, the customer experience, we're improving it. And those stores are actually showing us some of the highest same store sales year over year growth. Um, and it'll be something that we'll be rolling out to more, if not all of our stores in 24. Oh, fantastic. I definitely want to get to talking about the uh, the technology uh, in a moment, but I love that you mentioned discounting because I've actually written a bit about uh, discounting in the industry and kind of the patterns that we're seeing. It seems like it's kind of a debatable topic. It seems like certain brands are, it's either love it or hate it. Certain brands are increasing discounting or just saying we don't want to do that anymore. And it's all about everyday value. So how do you choose kind of which one is is best for Blaze? Yeah. Um, how we choose is first by understanding what is actually driving and motivating customers to uh, interact with this category. And you know, it you, you can't you can't operate effectively in isolation from what's going on with the competition in the marketplace. And so the pizza category unto itself, especially amongst you know those that consider themselves national brands, um, they are all discounting all the time on every day, if you know what I mean. And you know, we're looking at you know our stores, the average. A uh, unit volume of a Blaze pizza is going to be, you know, anywhere from a million three to a million five. And so for us to be effective, we have enough customers and fans who are going to come to us to provide us with the support for those levels of, 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 of sales. But then there's a whole bunch of other customers who, you know, don't consider Blaze because they're seeking uh, not everyday value, but feeling like they're getting more value than is what's available every day. And so we look at discounting by channel as an example. So you come into the store for one experience, um, but if you come in just to pick a product up and take it home, we can offer you a different discount than what you'd have necessarily in the store. Um, at Blaze, we're never gonna be a discount brand on all the time, but that doesn't mean that we can't create opportunities to leverage discounting to invite our customers in for another time that they may not have considered Blaze in that week or in that month. That definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and then to get back to you talking about uh, the technology investment, uh, could you get into kind of specifics on that and how you think uh, different types of tech investments helping operations and customer experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's talk about both, you know, customer facing, you know, technology as well as, you know, back of house or kitchen, you know, technology. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's start with the customer facing technology. Um, you know, I have a lot of experience um, in loyalty apps um, in from my previous history, both with uh, Starbucks as well as Focus Brands. And um, and of course, we all have experience now with loyalty programs, whether it's with hotels or other restaurants and whatnot. And certainly, you know, we're all willing to have an app on our phone if it's a brand that we interact with often or it's a brand that can offer us great incentive or value. You know, think about 
you know, staying at a hotel for three or four nights and doing that two or three times a year. And that's going to provide you enough points that you get a three day stay somewhere else, right? Well, that's a lot of value in terms of the dollars. But think about something that maybe you only visit once or twice a year and you spend five to seven dollars. Do I want to keep an app on my phone for four years before I get a free five dollar value off of something? It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, at Blaze, we know that our most loyal customers um, absolutely want to be a part of our loyalty program because they're visiting us, you know, two to four times a month. And so they're going to earn value, you know, within just, you know, a few visits um, of Blaze Pizza. But how do we incentivize customers who may not come to Blaze that often uh, to still be a part of our loyalty program so that we can market to them directly and turn them into more frequent visitors? And so there we're looking at new ways of participating in our loyalty program that doesn't require you to actually have an app on your phone, right? But rather allows you to sign in, so to speak, the moment you walk into the store, whether it's through kiosks in the store or new technology at the greeter. And so there, what we're looking at, now we're talking in-store technology. Um, previously at Blaze, you spoke to a greeter and there was no technology until you actually went down to the POS at the end of the line. Now we're looking at actually collecting information about who you are, if you wanna provide it uh, via phone number at the moment you walk into the store. That allows us to know whether or not you are a loyalty member and we can both acknowledge that we know what you love and or offer you special value um, as being a part of our loyalty program. Once you place that order with the greeter and you go on down the line and you customize, we now are capturing the amount of time it takes to move down that line. As mentioned, speed, 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 right? And so helping customers make decisions more quickly down that line and being able to measure uh, what that looks like various times of the day, various employees who are working the line offers us a chance to find out what are the behaviors that we seek to introduce in the restaurant to ensure that speed is balanced appropriately with that customer experience, both the customer who is having the experience and the one who's waiting for it next, if you know what I mean. And then of course we get to the POS and you pay for your pizza. How long does it actually take you know, to get your pizza from the moment you pay for it until it's actually in your hands? And we strive for 180 seconds or less but historically, we've never actually managed that. Now with new kitchen display technology linked into our POS, we can measure from payment to actually handing you your pizza and know that we are actually achieving our vision of great speed and a great experience in the store. I love that you mentioned this because so I was actually just at the FS Tech Conference uh, last month. And one of the things that people were talking about was actually how to apply loyalty type of technology, i.e. digital technology to your other customers, because, and this is something I didn't even really think about too much, is that your loyalty customers are really just your top 15 to 20 percent. Right. Okay, so why wouldn't you apply that same kind of thought process and, and digital technology investment to the remaining 80 <laughs> percent? Absolutely. And I want you to think about this too, uh, Joanna. So many brands identify you as a loyalty customer or not at the end of your experience, right? At the moment of payment, right? And everything that's happened before that, right? Talking with, you know, the greeter, talking with uh, the individuals who are actually assembling your product. Why do you want to wait until all of that is done to then say, oh, you're a loyalty member. Well, thanks for coming in and thanks for this order today. What if we do that from the very beginning, right? Welcome to Blaze Pizza. Oh, Joanna, welcome back. See that you haven't been here for a couple of months and that your favorite pizza, you know, is a gluten-free or vegan pizza, you know, with a spicy red sauce and pineapple and ham. Would you like your favorite pizza today? Like how much more magical does that feel if I can tell you what I know you love and help you place your order before you're making your payment? And that's what we seek and that's what we're experimenting with as, as at this moment. And that's why uh, data analytics in kind of in partnership with AI is, is becoming really crucial. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, one of the other things, um, you know, once upon a time, we, 
used to speak about the magic of personalization um, and loyalty as being kind of one-to-one -one marketing, right? It's all about you, Joanna. Well, uh, make uh, no mistake about it and certainly no offense, but there's probably a couple thousand people who are a lot like Joanna in this world, right? Who like a lot of the same things that you like. And we can identify you know, what those likenesses are based on not only the registered behavior that we have with the experiences that you show us in our restaurant, but online and, dare I say, even offline, right? We can identify that these are the things that Joanna and people like Joanna love. As a matter of fact, maybe we'll even call that customer segment the Joannas. <laughs> and knowing that Joanna's like, you know, vegan free pineapple and ham pizza, um, wow, there's someone else who's a member of the Joannas who also really likes a blueberry salad. Well, now let me ask my first Joanna if she would consider trying a blueberry salad um, when she comes into the store. And it turns out I've just offered you something that you didn't even realize that you liked as much as other people like you do. And that's another way to elevate our service to you and elevate your experience, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I just think that that's, that's gonna be the future of you know AI and data-driven uh, technology for companies. Um, and uh, so just uh, broadening it a bit, uh, what are you most excited about with Blaze moving forward and of any uh, goals that you guys have uh, either in the realm of technology, menu, uh, uh, in expanding uh, uh, expanding your store portfolio or anything really? Okay. So if you had another hour, I'd give you my entire list. <laughs> don't, uh, let me give you my top three. Um, I'd say first and foremost is really our new store formats. And uh, we are right now looking at um, smaller square footage that will allow us to deliver that great speed, speed, speed blaze experience um, in more localities. And that is not only standalone, uh, but it could be um, in end cap locations. It could be in non-traditional locations like universities and airports, et cetera. Um, in order to do that, of course, we're looking at new technology and equipment inside the store uh, to ensure that we can um, make and bake our pizzas with the same quality and the same theater that you've seen and have grown to love at Blaze Pizza everywhere that you go. Uh, we've just opened a 1,750 square foot store uh, in Florida. And um, you know, without giving you all the numbers, let me just say that it is exceeding our expectation by more than double digits um, in terms of its sales and versus the sales forecast that we had. So new formats, new markets, as we've already talked about, you know, bringing Blaze and that Blaze experience to more and more people around the world is going to be an exciting, uh, exciting opportunity for us and everyone on the Blaze team, and also for my franchisees domestically, right? Who gain the power of the of of, of the brand's extension um, and the pride of saying, "Hey, Blaze Pizza," you know, is now located in these corners of the world. Um, and then finally, again, we've mentioned already, new menu, new products, new flavors, and Blaze Pizza becoming the world's favorite pizza everywhere we are, um, are all really, really exciting um, things that are happening right now. Awesome. Well, we look forward to uh, hearing more in the future. Uh, thank you so much for talking to me today, Beto. Really appreciate it. Joanna, it's been my pleasure. And I really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about Blaze Pizza.